All right, everybody, welcome to our webinar today. I really appreciate you joining. Uh, really honored to have three distinguished guests with us. Uh, we have Brian Kelly, Kyle Dodd, and Greg LaRoche. I will give a quick background on, on each and then hand it over to Brian to lead our discussion today uh, about CMMC in higher education. So Brian Kelly is the AVP of Virtual CISO with Compass IT Compliance. Um, he's an active member of the higher ed InfoSec community um, and most recently served as the cybersecurity program director at EDUCAUSE. Uh, before that was the CISO at Quinnipiac and a retired Air Force cyber operations officer. So we thank you for your service there. Uh, Kyle Don is the ADP of the audit and risk management team at Compass IT uh, with 23 years experience working within the DOD. Uh, he currently holds multiple cybersecurity and auditing certificates, including CISA, CISM, CDPSE, and he's a RP within CMMC. And Greg Laroche, the VP of product at Prevail and is responsible for product management and compliance uh, with over 20 years experience leading product teams and delivering tech solutions to enterprises, both in the commercial and regulated spaces of cybersecurity, mobile app security, IT systems management, and healthcare. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Brian and I will share my screen hopefully in full slideshow mode here. Thanks, Seth. Appreciate that opening. Yeah, I think we'll jump to, I think slide three is sort of the timeline that we'll start with just to give some perspective and some context on where we are uh, as a community. Yeah, so thanks for this update on the timeline. So, you know, some of us were busy over the summer, but apparently the DOD was busy working. So back in July, uh, they officially submitted CMMC version 2.0, um, that rule uh, to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA. So we were talking earlier about acronyms and how to pronounce, I say OIRA. I don't know, Kyle, you could correct me if that's wrong. Uh, that's a, a subset under the Office of Management and Budget or OMB. And the rule is really the intent was with that submission over the summer, the rule would be reviewed and published in late October of this year. Um, as far as the DOD is concerned, that rule is complete. They've they've sent it in. We'll see what happens with the pending um, government shutdown in October, whether that moves or further delays. Um, and again, to whether the other thing to consider is also whether it will be a proposed rule or an interim final rule that's yet to be determined. And you know why that matters is it it will affect the CMMC timeline where we'll start to see that when we'll start to see that showing up in actual contracts. So you know why that matters. And and really, when you think of um, sort of the regulatory review or the countdown toward publication began once that rule was submitted over the summer, and you know it's it's all executive branches, all regulations, all rules have to go through this OIRA approval process for rulemaking, right? So that's where sort of that sits is in that rulemaking approval and process. Um, we know there's been a number of delays uh, that have faced CMMC over the last, I, I don't know, Kyle, it feels like the last decade, but it's, it hasn't been that long. Uh, it just feels that way. Um, and, you know, certainly submitting for submitting the CMMC to 2.0 to OIRA isn't the last step. It, now it's really, it's the rest of the rulemaking process has been set in motion from the OIRA perspective, right? And, and, we, and we all know, most of us know, right, the, the government bureaucracy around federal rulemaking means it could be a, a few more steps uh, before we start to see CMMC um, showing up in our contracts for our colleges and our universities or, or in, in general, where we might see that from our, a sub perspective as well. Um, you know, some of the other things in this timeline is to really think about, you know, OIRA ha has sort of 90 days to decide as they're going over that submission was back in July. That's where the October uh, date came from. That 90 day timeline time frame for OIRA is to decide whether they need to send that rule back to the DOD or that submission back to the DOD for revisions or forward it to the for publication to the federal register. Right. And that's, I think, what I was gonna say we're all hoping for, but maybe we're not all hoping for that, right? Um, but if it, it does move forward to the federal register, then you have this sort of timeline of a 60 day uh, public comment period. Um, you know, so again, if, the, if, it's, if it's published in the federal register in October, you know, we'd see that sort of comment period end toward you know, the end of December, 2023 with that 60 day public comment period. Um, but I like think a lot of that still is, is in flux based on you know, the timeline that we drafted, um, you know, sort of 
doesn't take into effect whether a government shutdown um, is is looming or not. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about sort of whether that whether CMMC when it does publish, whether it's published as either an interim final rule or a proposed rule, and that's sort of some of the ways that you know these things come out of OIRA is in either of those two forms. Uh, you know, the primary difference typically is is really will impact when CMMC goes into effect, right? When we start seeing that um, show up in contracts, you know, the difference between an interim final rule uh, from a language perspective is you can have an interim final rule effective before an agency responds to those public comments during that public comment period, or a proposed rule is effective after the agency has responded to the, the public comments. It's sort of that's the, the nuance of those two pieces of it. From there, you know, once we get past the comment period, once we see whether we have an interim final rule or a proposed rule, the the idea is that we'll start to see CMMC show up in in sort of a three year phased rollout um, into the contracts, into clauses in the contracts. Um, so here we are, you know, mid September of 2023. We're anticipating CMMC showing up in contracts in either late Q4 2024 or early Q1 2025. And we're having this, where do we start webinar today? Um, and why are we doing that? Because on average, and Kyle can dig into this a little bit deeper, but on average, we see you know, colleges and universities or any entity, therefore, that's you know, trying to be CMMC compliant, takes on average you know, 12 to 18 months to, to go from where do we start, right? Beginning that journey to being assessment ready so, you know, as a security practitioner, as someone that's been in higher ed for a long time, it's always like, let's let's start now. Don't wait for it to publish in the federal rule, uh, in the federal register, ra rather. What are the things that we could be doing now? How can we get started? So we've got a series of questions that we're going to throw at uh, primarily Kyle, and then Greg and I are going to help answer some of those questions with him. But just to sort of get us started, Seth, if you want to jump to the next slide, I think the real first question for, for Kyle is around, how does an organization know, right? How does a college or university know where they should begin? As we think about levels, um, and I'll, Kyle, let you talk about sort of the levels of a CMMC awesomeness, uh, as we were talking about earlier. Yeah, no, and you mentioned it earlier, Brian, uh, it's ta it takes time, that 12 to 18 months. And the first step is ultimately finding out what, what and if you actually need to comply with it. And the first thing is looking at the contracts that you may be bidding on with the DOD. And will I be uh, collecting or being able to affect the security of FCI or CUI? And once that's been determined and how you handle it, whether it's you're producing that for uh, a government entity or they're providing that to you, will help you determine that level. And with the initial implementation of CMMC, um, you know, three years ago, and we had five different levels and it was a little bit more confusing. And now after um, the request for comments that they got with assessors, and they've sort of tightened it up a little bit with the three different levels, one, two, and three. And I think that's really cleared it up uh, a lot from what it was. And essentially you could, you could look at a NIST 800-171 and say, this is this is essentially all the controls that I need to be in adherence with to be considered um, a level two office seeking certification or university, if that's what it was. So maybe you don't need to go directly to a C3PAO and say, hey, we're ready for an assessment, but some building blocks that you could start with would be looking at a NIST 171 um, and then just, you know, actually doing an assessment of the university and what types of information are being collected or are anticipated to be collected or produced for the government. And I, and I think we forgot to mention, too, that Q&A is available. If you have questions, feel free to drop the questions in there. I like these to be sort of interactive and get as much engagement as we can. I'm not sure if the chat function is working uh, where you where attendees can chat each with each other, but certainly in the Q and A, uh, let us know. And I think you know, Kyle. I think you know, sort of what I've seen in my experience is 
you know, a lot of times maybe the CISO or the CIO or the IT apparatus at a campus may not be necessarily aware of uh, all CUI and different research pockets of the university or uh, what a particular professor or, or research, yep. you know, is going out looking for grants. So, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, to some degree, it's it's starting to ask, right? And, and socialize this at a at a board or a president or cabinet level around where are we where are we seeing these these uh, potential impacts from our DoD research or DoD grants? I know a lot of the larger R ones research institutions are starting to staff up specifically uh, an individual um, for um, you know, research compliance, uh, whether it's CMMC or other things, just sort of outside the CISO or outside the CIO. Yeah, definitely. Uh, for a university, you're going to have to get that board level approval just so that they understand what's going on. I've went out and did a couple readiness assessments with some universities and it, it can be a chore if you don't understand where all those different um, pieces of information are and being able to get the board approval of, yes, we need to be CMMC compliant, we'll give you the resources. And that's what I found a lot was a lot of universities wanted to be CMMC compliant or start the process of it, but they're not getting those resources because they're, there are a lot of different things that go into this. It's just not, hey, we fill out the paperwork there, um, and here's our submission that we're CMMC compliant. Mm -hmm. Uh, the way that they've changed it is, you know, certain organizations are going to have to have a third party come and do it versus a self-assessment. And then most universities, except for very special ones that may be um, creating CUI at a national security level, may have to have a government led um, assessment. Yeah, and I think that the self I, I've always sort of explain the self-assessment versus having that third party is it's when I ask my teenager if they've done their homework, they always say yes. When I ask to see it, they say, they'll, you know, they'll be back tomorrow, right? So a um, little bit of that. Uh, uh, PCIs and PCCs. Right. Um, There's a question in, in, in Q&A from uh, Abdullah around, do we think Penn State will settle or go to trial? That's a you know, fairly new CMMC, CUI-esque case. I, I don't have a lot of detail on it. I And I'm I don't know where I would, I don't know where I would, you know, st say, I think it might be too early to say one way or the other, from my opinion, but I don't know, Kyle, if you've been tracking that or not, if we can come back to that later. Yeah. We need to come back to that one. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not a lawyer, but the you know, lawyerly answer is it depends. Right. Um, so, you know, I think the next question, if we jump to slide two is really around um, how do we scope it? Right. Is it the entire university? We talked a little bit about, um, you know, having a research function on campus and trying to keep it uh, scope there. You know, many folks over the years are familiar with sort of network segmentation. Maybe they've gone through a PCI DSS where you have to, you know, carve out or, you know, we, we like to use the word enclave when we talk about CMMC. That's clearly a DOD and a government term. Um, but can you give us a little background of what you've seen and what your experience has been there? Yeah. And for the the universities and the schools that I went and um, helped with their readiness assessment, they did have, they did set up those enclaves or segments. And that's, that's going to be the best way to do it. Because when you think about all the different departments, all the little pieces that are within a university and having that in scope of CMMC and all the, all the requirements and checks that need to happen it's more advantageous to set up that segment or that enclave to make sure that you have isolation that's proper for whether it's FCI or CUI. You have the access controls for the people that need to have the access, um, the, in the data that it's encrypted properly. And there's things within a university or a school that don't necessarily need all of that as much as FCI or CUI. And to apply those to those may cost more than what the university really needs to spend to be considered CMMC compliant. So definitely looking at ways that you can set up that enclave to segment that data is going to be the best approach. 
And once again, that goes into the 12 to eight mo- 18 month period. And that's on average, typically, you know, there may be some universities that already have pretty good segmentation set up and they can just add another section and hey, we already have done this. There's others that it may be hopefully not a flat network, but it's going to be a little bit of work for them to get to that to that point so they could safely say, yeah, we're ready for an assessment. Yeah, and I think those are always the challenges, right? Where, where the maturity of the organization, what structure they already have in place, how far along, right? Has there been CUI in place before they recognize that they needed to protect it? Those things come along and, you know, understanding how you approach it, right? And looking for, you know, there, there is a path forward, right? You've seen it with others. And I think uh, clearly higher ed, there's a lot of resources and we'll share some of those later on the community and how we can learn from each other and benefit from some of the, the solutions that are out there that others have figured out as well as um, you know, your own environment. So that, that's, and I think it's a good, you know, it's a, sort of a good way from like, okay, how do we segment, you know, and scope and build out enclaves to the sort of the next question, which is focus. We talked a little bit about sort of the, the personnel aspect of it. Right. And uh, you know, sometimes we'll see in these, in these compliance regulations, a, a named person, a responsible individual, right? So do we need a, a CISO or a full security team? I re, I remember right, when I was a CISO at Quinnipiac, I used to I used to view myself as a responsible person, but I often was also the responsible person, right? And they have two very different meanings, uh, especially for uh, when you think about lawsuits and, and being sort of held accountable for compliance or not compliance. So can you talk a little bit about from, a regu- from the regulation from CMMC 2.0, with regard to what you need for that that role or that that team on a on a campus, yeah, like I guess the short answer is <laughs> yes, but it all depends. So if you have a smaller organization, you could have a CISO that has multiple hats. That is that their sole job, and they're dedicated only to information security. Maybe not. Maybe they are also the CISO and the CIO and the network admin and the developer. And so having a lot of having all those hats puts a burden on that. Do you have to have a dedicated one? No, but it would be very beneficial depending on the size and complexity of the organization, how many people you have on your team, how many teams you have to be able to be able to monitor these systems and respond to activities if something were to occur. And, and again, I, I mentioned it earlier, we, we, when I was at Educause, we were starting to see some of the larger institutions that were sort of hiring and building out staff specific yeah. for that role. So not necessarily a CISO, they, they would have that somewhere else at the university level, but someone that was charged with CMMC compliance or, you know, in research security within the organization, right? So, um, responsible for that aspect of security within the, the campus. Yeah. And that's not saying that you have to go and hire a hire a, a, a CISO or an entire IT mm-hmm. team. There's multiple ways to do it. You could use MM, MSSPs. You can use those virtual CISOs. You just need to be able to manage that. And you are ultimately held responsible for those actions if you do decide to go with a third party like that. But you want to, when doing this, you want to make sure that, you know, you're finding those third parties that have the expertise and have the familiarity with what you're trying to do. It's not the cheapest. It's not the most expensive. It's the one that's going to fit your need and yeah, fit your need and be able to get you to where you need to be in the future. No, that all, that makes sense. There is a question in Q and A, but I think we've we've got one or two more, and then I think it'll dovetail into the technology. So we look at question four. We were thinking about you know, and I think that's a good follow on to where you just left off, Kyle. It was around sort of like, okay, how do we prepare as an institution for an assessment? Right? You were sort of saying, you know, it's not always the best. Sol- it, you know, what solution fits your need? What solution, whether it's from an assessment standpoint or how you move forward? So this I think is a good sort of follow up on. How do you prepare? Where do, you know they know that they're going to have a CMMC compliant c- compliance coming. How do you how do you start? Where do you start? You know where does the college or university begin if if they're at the beginning of this journey? Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, first it's going to be you know determining 
whether you're going to be having FCI or that CUI. And then in some special cases, if you are handling CUI, uh, depending on if it's determined that it's um, with national security interests, uh, that's going to determine some other things. But really, it starts with understanding what kind of data that you have. And then from there, all right, we now know that we have the FCI or the CUI. Where is it going to be residing? How are we going to protect it? Who's going to protect it? Who's going to notify us? Um, what is going to be the, um, the the frequency that we're going to have to be doing these types of ass assessments? We know that it'll need to be at least annually for a level one and some level twos. But should we be doing internal ones to make sure that the controls that we set up, we set it up January 1st and we don't check it till December 31st isn't really going to help you out when you're trying to attest that year later versus, hey, we're doing those periodic spot checks every quarter or whatever it may be. Um, and then the tools and things that may be needed to implement these enclaves and to protect that, um, C that FCI or the CUI and really seeing what's out there for solutions that could help you with it versus what can we do internally and it goes back to your 12 to 8 18 month thing it's not a quick process and it takes a lot of thoughtful um a thought thoughtful planning it can't just say we want to be here let's go yeah in, in conversation and engagement right i think that there's no cmmc in a box cmmc compliance in a box you can't go out and buy that compliance right it's really like you said i think understanding as you're entering into these contracts and we're seeing these clauses and understanding what type of data you, we have either as uh, research institutions or subcontractors or contractors directly from the deal. There's a lot of on-campus engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding, like you said, all of that requires uh, us introverted IT and security folks to get out and talk to uh, researchers, talk to you know our faculty and our staff in those areas to understand what they have, what they're doing with, and they sort of start to answer, right, all of those questions, build that, that, so that as you prepare for the assessment, you're ready. You know, yeah. we're, we're looking at sort of the, the next question you touched on, sort of the technologies, right? What are the technology fits? Yeah, the I was going to say, but real quick, before sure. we like move on to that one, um, even though you may have all that stuff implemented, what I find when I go and do these assessments, these audits, uh, it's documentation. It may be the greatest system in the world, but I don't have it documented. Having that network diagram, that data flow diagram, those are requirements. It was like being able to produce the documents that can confirm these are in place and operationally effective is huge. And that is a struggle for a lot of organizations. And that's not even organizations looking for CMMC compliance. Right. That's that's the audit across that's the, the board. Auditor. Yeah, right. And it's um and it's not unique to higher ed either. I think, you know, everyone when we think about IT operations or security operations, we're always like, let's just get it done. We'll go back and we'll document later. Right. And that could you know, the and that documentation is five years ago. <laughs> right. And it's always, you know, back to the homework analogy, right? Showing your math, right? Being able to, yeah, I've done it, but, you know, show me that you didn't, uh, you know, Google the answer. Show me that you have that documentation behind it. And a little bit of the next question is that, right? There's a big piece of that is policy, right? So uh, showing, you know, that you have a policy that dictates how you're going to be compliant, how you're going to do the work, standard operating procedures, all of that wickets. And then there's technology, right? And one of the reasons we're here and we're grateful that Prevail invited us to co-present today is they have a solution in this space. And you've said there's others that you know you're familiar with, uh, Kyle. Yeah, and and I, we're going to share think that it. might be in the link as well that um, Nick or uh, I was going to yeah I was just going to remind Seth. So if I, I don't I don't have the ability to share into chat to the attendees. So if you can drop uh, links that we shared earlier amongst the panelists out to the um, the attendees, that'd be great. That way they can be somewhat distracted while Craig and Kyle and I are talking. They can start clicking on things. I know sometimes we hold those in reserve, but um, at any rate, we'll get those links out. Make sure folks that are attending can see all that stuff. And um, I'll let Kyle, you and Greg talk a little bit about sort of what technologies and policies we need to get into this, into this path. Yeah. Uh, for that link, uh, 
one of uh, my coworkers, Derek, he actually found this and it, it it's funny. It's the center of CMMC awesome or the center CMMC center of awesomeness. And it's actually pretty awesome. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Uh, they actually have a spreadsheet that sort of breaks down of uh, the, uh, the size of the organization and the technologies and tools that could be used. And I've looked at it before and I'm like, yeah, there's Splunk and Webroot for a client, um, Office 365, stuff like that. And then doing this webinar with Prevail, I was like, oh, wow, they're listed here on the center of awesomeness thing. So I thought that was interesting. But if you follow that, uh, that link that either was shared earlier or that's in the chat now, it there this is not an exhaustive list these are suggestions but once again if you decide to go when you're doing part of your vendor due diligence is making sure that they're going to meet the the uh where you want to be not necessarily now but where you're going to want to be in the future and i and greg there is a question in in q and a around sort of authentication and authorization which may be a little bit on the periphery of where prevail touches, but it's sort of in that enclave, right? So, you know, should we be looking at a separate um, authentication or for CMMC in, in the enclave or is a shared service okay? Um, but a good opportunity to sort of talk about the space that you that you provide compliance with from a prevail perspective. Sure, yeah. I think um, maybe let me uh, riff on the technology topic first for a couple of minutes, and then we'll circle back and, and talk about a specific service like authentication. So uh, then it'll, it'll make a little more sense, I hope. So my comments are gonna mostly be geared around protecting controlled unclassified information or, or CMMC level two requirements, because that's typically where we're gonna have the most benefit as a vendor or a solution provider. So then going back to our earlier comments where we look at, well, what is the basis for, for all this work and all this study and documentation Kyle was talking about, and it all goes back to that 800-171 uh, baseline and those 110 controls and how do they apply to the information that flows through my organization? And so that's a big question, right? <laughs> and so the early comments were all around, well, how do we, let's define, let's figure out where it is and where it goes and who touches what and make sure we understand uh, the lay of the land and then select um, an approach. And we talked about Enclave. Now, this is where I'm gonna get to my point finally. So Prevail is really, um, a really good solution for an enclave type solution. And the reason we say that is because we see the enclave uh, decision being really, it's kind of two-sided. One is, yeah, you wanna control the scope and have the quickest, simplest, most effective um, uh, security program definition you can have and the, and the tightest boundary you can create. That's one side. The flip side is, well, we'd also don't wanna disrupt the rest of the business, right? So we don't wanna have to rip and replace, you know, the other 80% of what we're doing and so an enclave makes sense for us from a business standpoint, as well as a compliance standpoint. And so that's a really a place where we, we play as a vendor. So, and, uh, and in terms of the specific technologies, if you're not familiar with Prevail, we provide end-to-end -end encrypted uh, solutions as a service, as a cloud service. And principally we provide end-to-end -end encrypted messaging and we provide end-to-end -end encrypted file collaboration and sharing. And those are really two critical operations for CUI. So people need to talk about it amongst themselves and they need a, a secure messaging platform to do that on that's compliant. And, uh, and then they also need to share information, data, files, um, any kind of operational information, drawings. And so that you need a secure compliant place to do that as well. So that's really where we see a particular advantage. Now to get back to the question, uh, at hand is, you know, what does, you know, what else do I need to do, right? So on top of messaging and file collaboration, you also have a lot of other requirements in the 110 controls. And our system does participate in a lot of them to one degree or another, because we enforce a lot of the rules within our system. But there's also other things like auth authentication and authorization as, uh, as our question from uh, Colin came in earlier and saying like, well, what if I have an enclave? Can I use the same service to do authentication? And the, the short answer is probably, um, depends on how you set it up. Um, really, it's all about satisfying the, the, the assessment objectives for the 110 controls and, and the ones that pertain specifically to authentication and such. And those control objectives say things like, well, you have to understand if only authorized people can access the service uh, according to their role or according to your policy. 
And so if you can enforce that and document it and prove to an assessor that it is controlled and that only authenticated people are getting into the services, yeah, that can happen. You can use the same authentication on your commercial business as well, as long as it's you know meeting the requirement uh, within your enclave. So hopefully that helps <laughs> get around back to that question. So, but there is a there is a lot of um, technology decisions to be made because technology is a part of how these controls get implemented and enforced. But again, it also goes back to as Kyle was saying earlier, documentation. How do I document all that? How do I make sure I can describe the shared responsibilities between my technology and my policies and procedures and other things that are going to cover the control in its entirety? And so technology plays an important role, but I also say so does documentation, which is why we spend a lot of time as a vendor providing uh, sample and templated documentation to our customers to help them kind of get a foot up on whatever approach they want to take they will at least have um, a starting point in terms of how to document the coverage for all of those assessment objectives and controls. So that's a lot of words thrown at you all at once, but, but I think um, hopefully that covers the, the, uh, the question uh, thoroughly in terms of what technologies and how do policies fit in and, uh, and how that is really part a critical part of your path to CMMC compliance. Yeah, and that's a good point too, Greg. Um, you may already have that authentication within your organization. It's just maybe fine tuning it whenever implemented with an enclave. I went across to organizations like we have username passwords and then we have our multi multi-factor. That's great, right? And I was like, well, what's your re-authentication period? And they're like, oh, you know, it's like 95 days, 100 days. And I was like, does it really, is that really multi-factor? You do it once and then your password expires before your multi-factor re-authentication period is. So looking at fine tuning things like that, but you may already have some solutions and you don't have to go out and buy new things. Yeah, and that's a good, that's a cross section where the complementary between a technology and a policy, right? So you, you have the technology for you know, authentication, but the policy is that it doesn't have to reauth, right? So you, you have that reconciliation. Um, and I think we answered most of the questions. Uh, sort of the next one from Adula was around, how do you address each of the 320 assessment objectives. And that maybe moves us into question six, which is a little bit about what will a CMMC assessor or an I, every, a C3PAO, I can't, I always want to say C3PO. Uh, we've had this conversation before. What are they looking for when they're determining compliance, right? And how does that sort of map to the question that, uh, that Abdul asked in, in chat as well? Yeah. Um, so essentially as an assessor, we're going to go out there and we're going to take the controls that are, well, first off, we will scope the environment to ensure that it has been scoped properly, that the data types that have been um, identified by the organization are true and where they say they are supposed to be at. But essentially, we're gonna be looking at documented um, policies, procedures, uh, those network diagrams, access control, access management, uh, how do you respond to incidences, security awareness training of individuals, uh, configurations of different technologies, third-party vendor relationships and due diligence uh, activities when selecting vendors, um, risk management, um, internal risk assessment frequency, the continuing mo the continuous monitoring. The, uh, <laughs> As an assessor, I'm going out there and I'm I'm looking at every single control and everything that's going to be um, applicable to that specific one. You may have multiple different things that need to be looked at for a specific control. One of them being we'll, we'll stick with the authentication since that was just brought up. But, you know, we have different levels of enclaves. We have an enclave that works with FCI. We have one that works with CUI, and then we have ones that would work with that CDI or that national um, national security CUI. So we'll be looking at the the ways that the, the things that have been implemented for that to ensure that each data type is protected adequately, and having all those documents and all everything that we hate to do in place will definitely make the assessment go smoother, but 
a good practice is also to do a mock assessment before an assessor even comes out. And that could be done internally where I look at whatever the controls are for a 800-171 or CMC level two. And let's just run through this. Let's just talk about it. Almost like an incident response table talk. Let's look at these, talk them through, make sure we have, it was like, yeah, we do have this. Uh, I'm not too sure. Let's go check it. You could also, um, this is probably another link, but look at the uh, CMMC marketplace and go find um, some uh, uh, RPOs or that don't assess you, but they could get you in a good position with a readiness assessment. They're not the official assessors, but they can go out there. They're, um, right, they're, 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 they're they'll, they'll prep they're essentially, you. They're, it's essentially me. I'm a registered practitioner. I, I can't, certify assessments, but I can go out to organizations and then say, these are the things that you need to improve on. And when you do that assessment, more than likely you will pass it. I am not the assessor, but I can with a, you, with a you, certainty, with a certainty, I can say that you would pass it. A coach or a trainer. And uh, yeah. I think it was Lillian putting Q and a, the, the regulated research.org. We'll get that dropped in chat is uh a group that Carolyn Ellis uh, headed up, and I think is still a major principal. It's a great resource for for higher ed, not only for CMMC and and more more broadly around regulation. So we'll make sure we get that in the in the resources in the chat that we put out. So I just want to make sure we captured that. And I think you know the next question is all right. So we're ready. We're we're, we're coached. We got a trainer. We're getting prepared. How how often are we going to go through this exercise? Question seven is like okay. At what frequency are we attesting? Um, and there, is there different frequencies, I guess? So right now, uh, level one and level two, it's an annual self-assessment. With the exception of certain level twos that will be required to perform um, that the national security information, that'll have to be done by a third party um, it'll have to be done by a third party. And then those level three, the highest priority critical defense programs, that's going to be a government led assessment. So essentially, as long as you don't have national security or have critical defense programs, it's you can do a self-assessment annually. And I just I was re reading chat. I, I'm seeing the I'm seeing the links in chat. I don't know if uh, the rest of the attendees I just saw Abdul say the chat's disabled, so they can't click um, the link. So I love Zoom. I love Teams. I love Chime. I love WebEx. Uh, they all have different features. So we'll get that straightened out. If we can't before we end, we'll make sure we send the uh, attendees all the links that we promised we would. I think that's our almost our last question. Um, Kyle is our you know. Back to resource. Our last question is the answers that we're trying to provide in chat is, you know, the resources that are available both in higher ed and outside. We, you know, we have some of those. It's always good to hear what other people, if there's things we missed, I know some of that's already happening in Q&A, things uh, that we might want to share. Um, anything, Kyle, Kyle or Greg, that you're seeing from resources that are either new or tried and true with CMMC that we should be discussing or making uh, attendees aware of? Yeah, I would, I would say a few words on what we can expect in the near future for uh, official documentation coming out of the DOD. And I think that's um, an important topic because right now the documents we're going on are are, are old <laughs> they're, uh, and they're soon to be superseded. And so that, that'll help drive a lot of uh, clarity and certainty in the market. Right now, you know, like we said earlier, these a lot of these, all of these requirements are based on a NIST standard that is well documented and has been around for many, many years. So that's really not the problem. the The uncertainty comes in a lot of cases in like, well, what is? How do I scope my um, my enclave properly? And how do I? What are the obsess? What are the assessment criteria? How is an assessor going to come in and measure all these controls? Why, you know, what are the different types of CY and how they look at them in an assessment and all a lot of these things that we have a pretty good feel for what they are based on the previous documentation, but we're really looking forward to seeing the updated um, CMMC 2.1 releases that should be very soon hitting hitting the market when the rule goes into public comment. 
as uh, as we were saying at the top of the meeting uh, when Brian was was talking about timeline. So I think uh, you know that's from my standpoint. That's one resource we're all eagerly awaiting, and and then while we're waiting, <laughs> we uh, there are a lot of great things out there that uh, that um, Kyle was talking about, and there are a lot of links to resources that can be particularly useful. And uh, and again, there's lots of expert help available uh, out there if you need it in terms of uh, folks that are fully trained and ready to uh, assist in this area of expertise. So uh, that's, I was just gonna comment a little bit about, um, you know, final CMMC documentation that we should see pretty soon. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good call. And I think the, the community, you know, this community, especially in higher ed, they, they talk to each other, they work with each other. Uh, you know, again, the call out for the regulated research uh, group work, uh, community of practice or the RR COP. Uh, there is EDUCAUSE is coming up next month in October in Chicago. It's Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So there's sort of two aspects of that. One, I know that Prevail and Sanjeev and Virginia Tech and University of Cincinnati have a session, a breakout session for those of you that are attending EDUCAUSE. Um, I'll be there if you want to stop and say hello. And also um, just sort of thinking about um, awareness education, right? I, I'm coming from a higher ed background. I'm, I'm remiss to say training because we know a lot of times in higher ed, our faculty and our staff don't like the word training. Kyle or Greg, have you seen anything specific around CMMC sort of awareness education or things that with the, from a compliance standpoint, institutions should be looking at to ensure that researchers that are interacting with the, the CUI or the FCI are, are doing awareness education? Um, so there, there's not like one, one size fits all or whatever. There's multiple ways you could do this awareness learning or awareness training, whatever you want to call it. Um, but essentially it's there with it, within 800-171, there's certain, I can't remember what the control is off, off hand or whatever, but there's going to be certain requirements that talk about the different level, uh, the different activities that need to be included in awareness training. One of them being like phishing, insider threats, data protection, things like that. I can't remember it offhand. That's why I have, <laughs> that's why I have the list for them. So I can go and check to make sure it's all contained within the policy that it says awareness training that's done. And then reviewing those records of um, the records of completion for those people, and then actually the awareness training programs. I actually sit through it sometimes, and like just send me the link to it. I'll sit through it, make sure it gets everything that needs to be in there. And then if it's not, you know, recommending some enhancements to it. Make sure you consider whatever it may be that may be lacking. It was uh, another question sort of snuck in uh, through the, the chat versus the Q&A. It was around sort of grant or funding opportunities. So a lot of times the institutions are looking for maybe grants to help with CMMC compliance or uh, language where that can be included in contract clauses to sort of recoup or recover. I, I always forget the exact language for those yeah. additional costs. Any guidance on that that you could provide? So I'm not personally aware of it, but I do know that there are it was, it was when we were, they still had the five levels. It was CMMC level one. Um, we did a lot of readiness assessments in preparation that CMMC 1.0 was going to be the law of the land and everything like that. But understanding that, but there were some grants out there for organizations that said, if you do this readiness assessment, you don't have to pass it. You need to conduct it so that at least we have our baseline of where, um, issues may may be identified so that we have a roadmap to compliance when this actually does come into effect so don't know specifically specific grants that are available but more than likely they're probably out there yeah and what we see also in in the supply chain world which would also apply to the higher ed space the uh, the costs associated with pursuing these projects and, and getting yourself compliant those costs are considered allowable, right? So they can be rolled into your GNA and be part of your labor rates that you're quoting when you bid work. So that's all something you can consider as you're structuring and a budgeting for your CMMC journey. You know, know that you know those costs can be segregated and are allowable. So that that's just something else to consider. Uh, 
I was typing and those of you that know me know I can't talk and type at the same time. So that was the delay. Um, I was just going to add, there's also a student freedom initiative that is working with HBCUs under 800-171 and CMMC compliance. Um, so if you're an HBCU, I'll make sure we get that link added. Um, you might want to check out, they have some grants some funding um, resources there as well. And I think we're I, I think we're out of questions. I'm looking at Q and A. I'm looking at the additional nudges that that Nick was providing in the back end. Thanks, Nick, for that and your help, uh, Seth, on getting that. Hopefully, folks were able to click into the um, into the chat and see the links. If not, um, I think we have registration information that we can get this data back out to people. Uh, so you have it. Um, We'll watch Q&A. Uh, any final words, uh, Kyle, Greg, anything uh, we didn't miss that you desperately wanted to cover? Any like, oh, the gotchas or any, I forgot about this. I would say, I know the link is in the chat or whatever, but if you are looking for assistance with doing an assessment or anything, go to the, Cy um, the Cyber AB Marketplace and find people that are certified. Just because my website says it's cert that I'm certified and my organization is that, you have to go through training. You have to go through the process to become certified to do these types of assessments. And the marketplace is the only place that that, is, that, that record will be contained. So no matter what the website says, do your due diligence, go and check it. Don't get hemmed up for not having an actual certified assessor do these assessments when they do come into play. And yeah, we are yeah. recording and we are recording this and uh, there was a question, Seth, we'll send this to uh, the attendees, anyone that registered will get the link. And I'm assuming Nick and Seth, we might post it both on Compass and Prevail site as well for folks that weren't able to attend or want to go back and recheck what Brian was saying when he was talking so quickly, right? Um, That's correct. I'm, so, I'm sorry, you uh, you were going to jump in. I jumped. I, I just in. was going to make a parting comment um, to, to help us close out. We have a we have a lot of customers in our customer base that are struggling with this same you know CMMC journey and compliance and 800171. My you know free advice is not to wait too long because as you were saying earlier at the top of your presentation these these uh, projects take some time to implement. There's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of things that have to be done correctly that so that you can be ready for an assessment when that day comes. And uh, so don't wait. <laughs> this. Uh, there's a lot of help out there and a lot of solutions out there. And like we were saying, 800-171 has been around for a long, long time. So we, you know, everything is there that you need to implement a program that will put you in really good shape for when CMMC um, hits your contracts. And um, But in the meantime, you you may already have an 800-171 requirement in your contract. So uh, that, that's been in contracts for many years. So, uh, you know, that's the same set of requirements. So we, you know, we would just uh, recommend that you don't sit on this too long because, uh, you know, it's coming and, uh, and it takes a long time to be ready. Yeah. Uh, the other thing would be is as a higher ed institution, I've that I've worked with many information sharing between um, universities and colleges and schools. It's a lot better than private organizations for some reason. So use those types of resources. What are you doing to, you know, help out with that? Oh, didn't even consider that. And you know, it. don't try to do it on your own. Don't do it on your own. And, and that's a good positive tone to finish with, to wrap up the webinar, is that the community, and we know this in higher ed, and that we collaborate quite a bit, right? But I think it's good for the community to hear that we might be better in some instances than other, other verticals, right? And that's, I think, the, the beauty that you have, you see across different verticals. And I think in higher ed, you get very myopic that you're under resourced, we're understaffed, and maybe the Raytheons and the other large, maybe those folks have it better off. But your, your point's well taken is that this is a collaborative community and we can learn together. So uh, I, I'll, I'll close and say thanks, Kyle, for your expertise and, and support. Greg, thanks for, for joining and, and giving the technical spin. Uh, and thanks to Prevail. Uh, have, they've been a great partner while I was at Educause and the, the, throughout the year, Sanjeev uh, really has a uh, a special place in his heart for higher ed and he understands some of the challenges that we've isolated or talked about today. And I think he's, uh, that's why we're here uh, trying to talk to this audience to make sure that we can uh, collaboratively help each other. So thanks to everybody, Nick and Seth, thanks for your help behind the scenes. And uh, hopefully we get these links sent out to everybody and uh, have a great rest of your week.